I know that Magpie can be a billion pound market cap business in three to five years. We've built you know, a business at scale, but we do need to recognise it's not going to be around forever. We're not going to be able to continue to grow and prosper. And that was when we first started looking at the consumer technology products in particular phone. This is The Summit by Fearless Adventures. I'm Dominic McGregor, and every week my co-founder David Nunes and I will be talking to inspirational leaders about their experiences as they strive towards their summit. Thanks for joining us here today at the summit. Here at Fearless Adventures, we're talking to amazing entrepreneurs and founders of businesses about their journey to their own summit, whether they're still on that journey, whether they've reached it as well. Today we're here to talk to Steve Oliver, the CEO of Music Mad Pie. Welcome, Steve. Thanks for having me, David. When did you start Music Mad Pie, and then kind of what was the idea, and how does it yeah, what's the journey like? Okay, then? let's go right back go on to then. the... Are you sitting comfortably? <laughs> I go on, um. So, where did the idea come from? I'd had many years of being finance director and then MD of an entertainment retailer called Music Zone, which some of your listeners, if they're old enough, may remember. In its day, sold sort of cheap CDs, DVDs, games, a few books, and um, that sort of grew up in the, in the noughties. And in 2007... Uh, sadly, it had gone wrong. Uh, so the supermarkets had come into the industry and VAT free websites. And um, just to, towards the end of Music Zone, we'd sort of uh, seen the power of pre owned product uh, and uh, both buying and selling used product. And we traded a little bit. So myself and our, uh, my IT and ops director, so my co founder Walter Gleason, just started trading a bit of, of product really. And, and the idea of Music Magpie was born. So that was the, the embryo uh, in the summer of 2007. So I was you know, doing one or two interim jobs at the time, uh, trying to earn a living, because obviously it was a difficult <laughs> time, both professionally and personally. And you know, one that, you know, if I look back on now, it was, it was the most difficult time of my life, but you have to pick yourself up, dust yourself down, all those kind of cliches. And I thought there'll be more of those to come, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> got myself on the feet. Took a bit of um, friends and family type investment uh, and got going with Music Magpie that summer. So, um, yeah, just uh, from that little acorn in the garage, literally, <laughs> uh, of buying and selling a bit of product. Uh, and that's how we got started. Do you think you're born an entrepreneur? I think you become an entrepreneur. How do you, how do you see yourself in that debate? That's a really interesting one. I talk about this with my parents. I, I'm very close with my dad generally. and. It was actually my mum's dad that was the entrepreneur of the first ever laundrette in the UK many, many years ago. Where was that? It'll be the 50s, I think, for, uh, yeah, just after the war. And we were talking about, you know, that entrepreneurial blood, is it in you or not? And I think, you know, I've always been somebody who's been intrigued by life generally. I did psychology at university, and I think um, entrepreneurs constantly seek to find answers in life rather than just moan about problems. I do think, um, you know, it's probably always in me. I can't give you that sort of typical, oh, I ran the tuck shop at school kind of thing, but I did always have, you know, on my mind sort of, you know, that I always wanted to be from an early, early stage, really, a sort of employer rather than employee. So I probably subscribe to that you're born to it. But then as always, you know, the right opportunities has to come along in life. So, and I mentioned Music Zone then, and, um, you know, I joined Music Zone as finance director, but recognised him, Russ, the foundry, was a wonderful trader and great guy but he was struggling with the business as it grew up and I think he needed somebody like me ironically given that you know we're talking about entrepreneurial but I, I'm quite good at doing some of the boring things in life so you know with my accountancy background I quite like controls and systems and doing things you know and growing and scaling and applying myself problem solving um, so yeah finding the right opportunity then just to apply that sort of entrepreneurial spirit really so yeah and then I see it flip into the execution stage, where I think we've all got ideas, but the actual then taking the risks, practically building something, is like another level beyond, I even think, entrepreneurs. I agree with that. I, I meet a lot of potential entrepreneurs, I'm sure you two do, um, where they're great at having the ideas, but they call themselves starters, not finishers. Mm -hmm. And I think that you do need that ability to... I also, wonder, uh, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, I meet a lot of entrepreneurs who underestimate the hard work that is needed. They just think they can do the idea bit 
and then you know it will come because somebody will give them some money and you know they can do it and it'll all be great fun and bean bags and you know <laughs> Great fun. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You will get me on a beanbag, that's for sure. Um, but um, yeah, I think you know you have to be able to recognise that it's damned hard work, and you've got to apply yourself. But equally, if you get that opportunity, don't let it pass pass you by. It's uh, you know, it's there is nothing can beat it. Uh, so 2007, day yeah. day one of the journey, day zero of the journey, maybe. Yeah. You're looking at where. You know, the world's in a very different place. Well, not a lot of different things now. The world's in a bit of chaos. How are you setting out on the journey? Um, and where are you trying to get to? It is funny, Dom, I was reflecting uh, over the weekend that not a, a dissimilar period in life in terms of recession and consumer cost of living challenges, etc. So if you think back to 0708, there was a run on, was it Northern Rock, the bank? And yeah. actually Martin Lewis came to the fore as a consumer champion with his moneysavingexpert.com uh, weekly email, which actually played a huge part in Magpie's um, development because we'd only been going a few months um, and we were just starting to buy and sell a few CDs and DVDs on the site and we'd, we'd launched it and, you know, it was very interesting. We're growing it and then suddenly uh, as you know and to this day it's still the same with Martin Lewis's money saving expert you you can't predict you can't influence you can't dictate when what he's going to do and when he's going to do it he just started covering music magpie so he puts us in the newsletter and three days later appears on GMTV with Lorraine Kelly and starts talking about oh I found this new service where consumers can raise cash get up to three pounds for their old DVDs and there's a bar at the bottom <laughs> get up to three pounds for your old music uh, 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 DVDs uh, and CDs on Music Magpie Lorraine Kelly I'll go home and do that now Martin and she did she did a transaction did with really? us but it was money can't buy marketing we were nowhere near ready for it it actually it made us but it nearly killed us because we went from buying 600 units a day to 17,000 and we'd have bought a lot <laughs> more. three pounds each. <laughs> Not all of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, we'd have bought a lot more than that, but the server blew up. We could, you know, the infrastructure was like, there was a, you know, it's like, it was literally like, oh my God, what, what are we going to do? But that, you know, as I look back of all the moments and threshold days, but what that did is tell us, especially in challenging circumstances, should we say, in life, you know, our counter cyclical model of giving cash to consumers for their old stuff and saving money when buying from us for as good as new product at a fraction of the price works. It's something that's interesting. So actually that gave us the confidence to go and make our first TV advert and start to put it on in the daytime when you know adverts were uh, uh, cheaper than the prime time. And we really started to, to scale the business. So my Dragon's Den moment was in those first few years. We went half a million turnover first year, so that was uh, 07, 08. And then we did two and a half million, 11 million, 34 million, 63 million uh, and in that, those first few years. And that was literally all on physical media, CD, DVD, uh, games, and latterly books uh, in those. But you know, the decluttering of those products was very popular and it was a great way to raise cash. So. You know, it, it, I, I owe him a lot. He's also a city fan like me, Martin Lewis, and I've never met him, but I'd definitely buy him a pint uh, <laughs> for both of those reasons. So how much did you actually give to, back into consumers' pockets during that period? Oh, we were, um, I mean, that, that I guess was the, the benefit of the selling service, both that decluttering, but it was for cash as well. And uh, I guess, you know, I mean, now that figure is three to four hundred million pounds of, 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 of yeah, yeah. For, you know just tax-free cash for, for their old stuff that's just lying around and then I'm sure we'll sort of touch on the environmental aspect to the, yeah. the to the service as well now but I guess if you take that year of 11 million turnover a simple bit of maths where you know with the margins we we're making was probably two to three million pounds a year that we were get, paying out to consumers but actually that was we actually, I remember thinking back, we put that figure on the website because it's a massive statement of it trust. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, three million paid out. Yeah. Uh, and we had a, a rolling counter every day of how much we paid out. So, yeah, it was, um, you know, it, consumers just liked it. They did it. And there was that dynamic in physical media where there was people who'd stopped consuming CDs and DVDs. So they were just pure sellers yeah. because they'd gone digital. There was people that were still active in both, so they were making room for it. And there was some people in the middle, and I guess, you know, even now people think you either have to be 100% digital or you're still doing physical product. 
I think there's plenty of people in the middle who recognise that CD and DVD is a passion product, it's a hobby. You know, we all enjoy displaying them in, in our lounges on bookcases or, or whatever, so. I think last year was the first year of physical book sale growth. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, the, the Kindle and Amazon Digital it was going to demolish the book industry and it certainly knocked it down for a few years, but it's now recovering back up. Yeah, yeah. It is, a, it is a passion and a hobby. This isn't like buying an ink cartridge. It's, <laughs> it's something you enjoy doing. I think we all ran at the digital thing really quickly and everything tried to become digitalised. Yeah. And people have gone back, well, no, actually, I don't like listening to audiobooks. I don't like reading on a Kindle. I'll use a physical book. Yeah. And people have started to, like you say, not just the hobby, but also the choice. Agreed. Digital exists, physical exists. Pick what you want. Yeah. And people are going, well, I want physical, so I'll buy physical. Absolutely. But then I guess, you know, to sort of leap forward a, a few years in the cycle, we did recognise that we'd built a business on that. We'd gained many millions of registered users. We'd built that trust, the brand. People understood it. It was called Music Magpie. Maybe we'll come on to that as well. But, <laughs> you know, we did have to do the first major pivot of the business to look forward and say, you know, this is great. We've built, you know, a business at scale, but we do need to recognise it's not going to be around forever. We're not going to be able to continue to grow and prosper. Uh, and that was when we first started looking at the consumer technology products, in particular phones. So you reached that 63 million. Yeah. Do you appreciate you're on top of a summit there? Or are you in that mindset of... How are we continuing to get to the next one? Yeah, I guess, you know, thinking about, again, that definition of an entrepreneur, you, you, you can never rest on the summit you're on. You always have <laughs> yeah. to look, what, what's the next one? I'm still doing that now. You know, we all do that, don't we? And, um, you know, I guess we had to think, well, actually, you've got a responsibility as well now because you've got hundreds of people working for you. And how am I going to secure their long-term welfare? and the security of the business. Around that time, so 2015, we did a, a private equity deal with MBM in Manchester, uh, and they injected some capital which allowed us to pay consumers as soon as they sold to us. And that was a massive threshold moment. We'd always, the working capital model of Magpie was that if somebody who sold to us didn't get paid straight away, I whisper this quietly, I can say it now because it doesn't <laughs> apply, but that allowed us to just to get a bit of a head start in starting to sell some of that product so we could make the working capital cycle work and allowed me to build the business without debt in it, which was a key learning from the Music Zone experience. Um, so actually, uh, when MBM invested, we could pay people as soon as they told something, which on a more expensive iPhone, as they were starting to develop, so when, you know, back in the world when there was iPhone 3 and 4, but there were three, four, five hundred pounds. Yeah. So whilst people were perhaps happy to wait 40, 50, 60 pounds for a box of their old CDs, which they were probably done with and was more decluttering, this was more emotive. They wanted paying straight away. They wanted a great price. They wanted trust. They wanted to trust who they were selling it to, but they wanted paying straight away. And that was another real threshold moment. And did you have people like for that? Did you have people telling you phones aren't going to work in the business? Um, possibly, yes. Um, and I mean, you know, one thing I've learned absolutely is go and ask customers. Just go, do the customer <laughs> research. Go, before you do anything, whatever you sit yeah, there yeah. thinking, this will work, that, that they'll be interested in that, go and ask them, go and yeah. research them, survey them and say, what else would you sell us? And, and that's, you know, we, we, we were starting to grow up a bit as a business and we did. That actually is coming into more things now. Kind yeah. of the circular economy is becoming bigger for sustainability reasons, but also for trading reasons, you know? People are buying more clothes to sell, the drop, drop culture in fashion's changing, people buying and selling and reselling. How, how do you view the kind of, the, the wider circle economy outside of the tech products? I think it's utterly fascinating because re-commerce, this reverse commerce, the process of selling to a website and making it as easy to sell to, that it should be to buy from a website, uh, really encourages that circularity. Um, I think the whole concept of second hand, um, the challenge for a re commerce business was always actually to acquire uh, the product from consumers to persuade somebody to sell it to you. You could always generally resell that product. But I think fashion is slightly different with that because there was, I think, a bit of a stigma, shall I call it, with second hand clothes you know let's use that expression it was at best it was a bit niche at worst it was a bit grubby it was like is that a bit charity shop and a bit yeah. and actually now i think there's been this massive sea change in a lot of product category but if we just think about fashion it's now smart and savvy and mainstream 
and younger folk and young consumers now will not just more comfortably do it but tell their pals I, I've, I've done something that's really smart I've saved money it's a great product look at this and they'll tell the mates about it I think it's excuse the point again it's gone full circle where actually it's gone from this something that was a bit niche and and you know grubby to you know very mm -hmm. accepted mainstream activity now mm -hmm. and something that people boast about yeah, yeah. doing because it's smart for the planet as well but also i think i think from the seller point and the, the buying point because the seller point has made a bit of money and the buyer's gone well i really wanted that yeah and i found it yeah you know not just vintage things now but current products and trend products and you then think about the brand and the retailer's attitude towards that circular economy and buying back the old one when selling a new one and that's something that Magpie is really interested in, calling it Magpie Circular. And it's that ability to help a brand or a retailer develop that offer where it can be, be classed as a bit of a discount when selling whatever it is you are mm -hmm. selling. It could be fashion, it could be a bike, it could be a musical instrument, it could be a phone, whatever. But, you know, Apple themselves now do it. They do it quite well. They don't offer as much money as we do on the trading price. But, you know, they are doing something where you can use that old item as a kind of deposit. Um, but actually, what it allows the brand and the retailer to do is demonstrate their ESG qualities. So that item's not going to end up somewhere it shouldn't, yeah. which in a lot of the time is landfill. But they can basically control that secondary market while offering a great ESG. And we all understand the importance of that to, to a corporate as well as a consumer now. On that point, the purpose versus profit debate. Day one with the CDs, the focus is profit to yeah. live. Yeah. When that journey to you start to pivot towards, I'm actually having a bigger impact on the world right now. I think the, the world has woken up in the last, shall I say five years, but I think in particular the last three, three years. Ironically, you know, one of the dynamics I think the pandemic brought the world is this kind of being kind to each other. Um, you know, if people woke up to the importance of community and looking after each other and the community charity causes, etc. And I think people um, also woke up well and truly and there was these wonderful things, weren't there, about was it swans that were going down the, uh, the, the main canal, Grand Canal in Venice for the first time in 50 years and the air quality improved and all that. It, it just accelerated that whole thinking about we need to be kind to the planet and now everybody has well and truly woken up to that. And I think the answer is it can sit really nicely side by side. You know, a business can't just do that. It has to be commercially viable as well. But if it can demonstrate both of those qualities, you know, being a consumer champion model and, and it's doing good for the environment. We've been a recycling business for nearly 15 years now. Nobody really cared for 10 of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, they do, but they do now yeah. uh, because they know how important it is to... The, the earth. It started with consumers and then I think corporates and investors now. I mean, you, well, yeah, this I mean, is your game. That's the big question, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and I think the big question <laughs> is, do they just say they care or do they actually care? So on that note, obviously every entrepreneur's dream is to have an IPO. Yeah. Um, it, it, <laughs> go on. The moment, you know. <laughs> before, before, the, before the IPO. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to us about the run-up before then. What was the thing that inspired you to go and do that? And was it hard? Talk to us about the process. Everyone would be fascinated to learn about it. Oh, let's start with was it hard? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was. Um, because you talked about ringing the bell, actually. And unfortunately... Is ringing um, the bell in the UK? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you, yeah you stand one. on the balcony oh, okay. right. of the LSE. And right. I think, yeah, you, I think you press a button to ring the bell. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, <laughs> in April 2022, when we did ours, 22nd of April it was last year, we were the last business to do it virtually. So, I mean, loads of... You know, bizarre, <laughs> surreal kind of moments. But basically, I'm doing the whole IPO through a screen. So wow. meeting all the institutions, doing all the investor presentations, very often to a black screen with no video on and the microphone muted. I'm pouring my heart out eight hours a day telling the story over and over and over again. And, you know, my voice is going, and but I'm, you know, pouring my personality as much as that. And I, and I hate it, I have to say, how much. So I think we're all the same, aren't we? You enjoy meeting people and... Yeah. It's so much easier. And I think, although I think what I will acknowledge is physically it was probably easier, you know, that I wasn't racing around London and yeah. telling stories. So practically, at least I was doing it just from my own hand job, but mentally it was exhausting. What I will say is a lot of people advised me not to do it. Um, they said it would be, um, you know, really difficult, challenging. Don't put yourself through it. Um, I, I knew private 
equity world and, and that environment very, very well. Um, and and on a, I have to say, on a personal professional level, if that makes sense, I always felt like it was the last thing to do for me, the last ch- barrier, sounds like some sort of film blockbuster, in it, but the, the last area of business that I hadn't done, having done everything from startups to scale-ups to M&A and all sorts of different things over the years. And I was, I was fascinated by it and almost... Again, this kind of person I am. The more people that said don't do it, the more <laughs> I wanted to do it yeah, yeah. to experience it. And if I, so, that's that's the me side of it. And and Ian, who was a CFO, is now COO. You know, really good partner in the in, in my partner in the business and dear friend. I think you know we both felt that it was a really fascinating professional challenge. But then when you thought about the business, it was the right thing to do for the business as well. And um, you know, actually. The, the profile was ready for it. We've definitely benefited from enhanced profile that public life brings you. And uh, this was the PR answer at the time, but it was the truth of um, it gave us access to capital. So we had two big growth strategies, both that needed some additional capital bringing into the business, which were the kiosks, which are our new way of buying product in, in Asda. So we're rolling out uh, those at the moment. We'll have 300 kiosks uh, by the end of this year. And also our rental offer, where we're not just offering refurbished iPhone for sale, uh, we're now renting them out, but we're putting them on our balance sheet. So it, it, it needed some fairly significant uh, capital coming to the business. So it was right for the business. Obviously, you know, again, we talked about that, about the pandemic before. The world had gone online even more. It accelerated that move to, you know, push people uh, online. So it, it was the right time to do it. Um, for both us as people and uh, the business. Uh, but yeah, it was, I mean, you know, my two top tips are surround yourself by great people, as always. Uh, you know, that's a general kind of thing. But if you're going to do an IPO, you know, I was out of the business for 90% of the time for three, four, five, six months, um, as was Ian. So the team had to run the business. And equally, the other very obvious advice is just get yourself brilliant advisors and people who look out for you and just keep everything in order. You, you two know that. That's how to minimise disruption. You know, the, the biggest danger with any any deal in any business is disrupting trade, isn't it? Um, so if you get the good advice and the great team, it keeps you on track. And go back to the whole investor piece then. So, yeah. you know, are investors of funds or, or, or fund managers in the UK, are they ready to invest in e-commerce businesses and see the future and almost take a bit of a bet on where that sector's going. Or are they still obsessed with, you know, dividend generating businesses that, you know, they can absolutely be consistent with versus in the US where perhaps there's a different mentality from an investing perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, um, would you list again in the UK or would you do it somewhere else? So I don't, I've read other people's answers to that as I'm sure you have. I think um, there's a lot of specialist ESG funds out there now, so impact type funds. Yeah. Now, actually, our observation is a lot of them work in that um, higher end, bigger market cap. And so, you know, we had an ESG fund in particular. There's one I was thinking of where uh, they loved us and they were definitely, a, a, you know, somebody who would have done it. But the market cap we pitched at at the end wasn't quite. They, they only wrote a check. Uh, they didn't write checks less than 30 million, but they didn't take positions bigger than 10 percent. So our market cap at 210, which is where it was just a fraction under 210, um, it didn't quite work for them. But so there's a lot of that bigger end in our kind of micro small uh, cap end, less specialist ESG funds. So you're now into people who say we care about this stuff. But actually, you know, if there's been a key learning about public life, it's they perhaps do but they care about the numbers a lot more. Yeah. And it's all about hitting your numbers, you know, and whatever your story and whatever the circumstances, you've got to hit your numbers. And that's not, you know, and this has been a real key learning and, and difference between public and private. A private will back your three to five year story. Yeah. And you know, I mentioned our rental offer before. We actually sacrifice revenue, cash and EBITDA if we rent instead of sell. Um, it's a greater medium and definitely longer term yeah, reward because yeah. we're now seeing the renewals come through from them. But in the short term, we've sacrificed some performance by by developing that. And that's been a challenge to explain that, get it across to the public investors because they want to see uh, today's numbers. Yeah, and that, that's that's been probably the key learning of the, the two different 
sides of the equation. So what's the future for Music Bagpie? Where's the summit? Where is the summit? Well, the, the summit is always the next one, isn't it? So, um, yeah, we've got these. We've got the growth strategies. So, I've, you know, I've mentioned, uh, and actually, I've, do you know what? I've, this is perhaps risking overstating, but the biggest pivot we could do. So, we've done three or four real pivots as we went into America, um, as we've taken customers off the platforms, the biggest seller in the world on eBay and Amazon, but we've moved them onto the Magpie Store. Ironically, actually, we're reversing that a little bit uh, at the moment. Um, but having done these pivots, the biggest pivot we could potentially do next is going from consumer to corporate. And I think that is where we'll, we will now start to, start to take our services, both people selling into us and us selling and renting. I know that Magpie can be a billion pound market cap business in three to five years. I absolutely know it. That is my strategy. I've got a really clear vision about how to get there. Um, and that's, I guess, you know, I'm trying to answer your straight question. With a straight answer, that's the summit really that, you know, that's the next one I've set myself. You know, there's a number of people have said, yeah, you've done it now, that's it. But I'm like, no, nah, I want to try and get it to the next level. I'm really clear on that vision. Thanks for the discussion today, Steve, really. Really enjoyed it, and uh, yeah, I always enjoy having our conversations, and good to get this one filmed. <laughs> yeah, and, and we managed not to talk about football, which is probably banned for another two or three <laughs> weeks, so that's good. Oh, and hey, thank you for listening, and if you enjoyed it, like, share, subscribe, and have a great day.